But I just find it astonishing that it's an error that one vehicle has hit. To, to hit three vehicles is absolutely staggering. I believe it's some type of spike ball variant. We know it's small. We know it has incredible penetrating power. And the other interesting thing about this munition, it can be used with or without a fragmentation sleeve. So in some incidents, and I haven't managed to look at, I haven't had forensic imagery of, of the three vehicles killed in this incident. So I don't know whether fragmentation sleeves were used on the missiles in this incident or any of the vehicles. But many of the scenes I've visited in the past, there's been a very definitive fragmentation in the in the effects of the of the blast. And these fragmentation sleeves result in very definitive cube cubular fragments. And so the surrounding area of the target is the, the holes in, in the target area are very definite squares. But some scenes I've visited, you know, don't have this fragmentation. Incidentally, it's the same munition that you may have heard about the the policy of the knock on the roof in Gaza, whereby a small munition is fired onto the roof of a building to give the occupants warning to get out. And this is the same missile that's used in the knock on the roof, possibly with even, an even more limited explosive or no explosive in the, in the missile itself. So I've been to several of these where it's been used as, as a warning system to tell the occupants of a house to get out. Well, I, I can only surmise how it happens. We know it's drone fired, and I believe it was probably, the targets are probably acquired, and the missile is probably targeted by a separate drone. But I'm, I'm purely surmising that because, you know, we know, I mean, the area is being watched and surveyed the whole time by drones. You know, we can barely see a, a piece of footage coming out of Gaza now without this, this constant hum in the air, this constant motor buzzing overhead. So, you know, we, we we must assume that everything is being watched the whole time. And we must assume that they know the Israeli Defence Forces, Israeli authorities, the Israeli security forces know exactly what is going on. There's observation drones loitering the whole time. And I think when they see an, ob a, an opportunity target or a target that they've been waiting for, that is the time they, then they will release a, a drone-fired missile. And I believe these missiles are probably fired from something like a Hermes or a Predator that is loitering elsewhere. And I doubt whether the missiles are actually being fired from the drone that is loitering overhead, conducting these surveillance activities. Well, I think so. And I think that is certainly a, a, a signature of this particular weapon system, that, that the, the blast is very intense, but very limited. and and the collateral damage, you know, is in, in all my experience of this particular weapon system, the collateral damage is is negligible. In fact, I've actually been to one scene where a car was hit, the two front seat passengers were killed, uh, and the, you know, the person in the rear seat was, you know, by accident or design was, I wouldn't say he was unhurt, but certainly survived the incident. So the munition does provide this very intense but very limited blast. Yeah, I mean, this is just speculation, how, how this happened. But it's, you know, one can really speculate on how on earth this happened. But I just find it astonishing that it's an error that one vehicle has hit. To, to hit three vehicles is absolutely staggering. And we've, you know, we've also got to take into account they had professional security operatives with them. And, and now this is a, film, a field I've been working in for 24 years now since leaving since leaving the military. I've been on what they call the circuit, doing security tasks in in high-risk areas for, I and mean, I personally work, work for the media, so I work with TV crews. These three operatives were working for a very reputable company, and they were these were guys top of their game. And I cannot believe for one minute they did not adhere to every single protocol, policy, and pro security procedure that would have been put into place before this operation, before they deployed. You know, uh, you know, they would have been in touch with the Israeli Defense Force or whatever the, the portal is, the Israeli authorities, with timings, with locations, and with movements. And, and it is inconceivable that you know that there was some sort of break, that much of a breakdown in communication, that the Israeli authorities did not know that this was a WCK convoy 
and then there was a, hum a humanitarian mission of three vehicles. I mean, perhaps one strike on one vehicle could possibly be excused as a mistake, but but three is just I find utterly staggering. Technology should should enhance well, enhance warfare or, or certainly limit the chance of just this sort of incident happening. But that does, just doesn't seem to be the case. And yeah, I'm just very worried about the sheer number of incidents that are, that is occurring at the moment in Gaza. And, and you know, we can, we can list them. I, the last one I looked into was the was the attack on the MSF house by, by an Israeli tank. And that was ind indisputable because it was it was by the nature of the ground and the trajectory of the round, that round was fired from very close range onto a building with an enormous banner with Medicine Sans, Frere hang, Medicine Sans Frontier hang, hanging outside. So certainly technology should be limiting the amount of uh, mistargeting or collateral damage, but it just doesn't seem to be the case, especially, as I said, you know, with the advanced technology, with observation devices, certainly, uh, and the amount the Israeli authorities must know about what is going on in Gaza and who is where, it doesn't seem to be having any limiting effect on the number of of, of mistargeting or wrong targets that they're engaging. Of course, you know we do call, and we call them blue on blues, and tragic incidents do happen. But I just think the consistency in the number of incidents in this particular conflict is is out of all proportion we've looked you know we've seen the attack we've seen the attack on the aid convoy or two, two attacks i believe on two aid convoys i mean these these are just not mistakes these are not mistakes happening through that aid convoy you know may may have had some additional purpose or um, there are just too many of these and, and i believe it borders on lack of fire discipline poor command and control and they're just completely reckless use of force. There, there doesn't seem to be any. You know, in Afghanistan, we had we had an, on my last combat tour, we had a thing called courageous restraint, which meant that even if you, you were engaged from a compound or from a location, it got to the stage where you just could not automatically fire back. You had to be cleared to fire, and a, a higher authority had to ensure there were no civilians. And there would be no collateral damage. I mean, even back as 1976, I was fired at by a gunman in Londonderry over the top of a lady in a pram. And I had this huge Fijian Lance Corporal by my side. And I was far more frightened of him than I was of the gunman. But I knew I could not fire back because of the collateral damage. And this is something 40 over 40 years ago.